along the coast of Mexico's Baja Peninsula, a little inland from Ensenada and centered in the Valle de Guadalupe, lies the most productive wine country in all of Mexico. And though it may surprise many of us in the United States, Mexico is producing wines that rival anything from California. And you know that laid-back mood of this beautiful wine-growing region is mirrored by an openness, a welcoming spirit from the area's winemakers. Hugo da Costa is a patriarch of this valley's wine industry. He had a hand in developing many of the local wineries by operating a hugely popular wine school here. I stopped by one of his own vineyards, Casa de Piedra, to review some of the basics of winemaking with him, and of course to sample the current vintages of Casa de Piedra wines. So this is, these are the tanks for fermenting, is that right? Exactly. You're going to crush, okay. and crush is just taking away the, the little piece of wood that, yes, that the, the grape stamp. has, the stamp, so putting together, that we call maceration, right. and the rest is fermentation. After you've done the maceration and the fermentation, you got to get the skins and the seeds and all that out of there, right? And you press, mm -hmm. and you have an extra wine there and it's very, very concentrated. So the after, the only process to, to, that you need to do with the wine is waiting. So where do you go So then you can do that, that? In, a, in a tank, or you can do that in barrels. Okay. So it depends the kind Show of Show me those barrels. Certainly. When you talk about barrels, you have uh, two components. Mm -hmm. the, the flavor of the oak, Okay. And the natural oxidation because there's a little holes in the wood uh -huh. that soft the wine. And then it goes into the bottles. And then you mix everything yes. again to have uh -huh. a, a only a one batch right. and go to the bottles. But every, every particular wine mm -hmm. has different capacity of aging. Mm -hmm. People go live faster and they don't wait, so they are drinking <laughs> wines that are younger than... Rushing, the rushing, 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 all the time. rushing all the time. I, can I rush to taste some of this with Certainly. you? Okay. Sweet pleasure. <laughs> Let's do that. <laughs> this is the moment I've been waiting that, for. That's really the This the is really what it's really all about. What are we going to taste first? Well, that we're going to taste then. The Piedra de Sol, uh -huh. and like I told you, you know, the idea is to have a fresh, fruity wine that tastes like grapes. Well, it certainly doesn't smell like a big, buttery, oaky Chardonnay exactly. that a lot of people are exactly. used to. Exactly. That's Our idea is more a wine that could um, play well with the sea, seafood, not the shells. Yes, 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 yes. Shells. Okay, what's the second one? The second one? is the Vino de Piedra, a blend between Tempranillo and Cabernet Sauvignon, half and half. Why do you put those two grapes together? Well, yeah, I think we need it. Uh, Tempranillo grows very, very well here. It has a lot of characteristics and natural characteristics, and the Cabernet is really the a structure of the wine. So it's always healthy you know, to have the body. And you play with the flavors of Tempranillo, and the Cabernet is more the, the structure, the body of, of the wine. I bet this goes really good with these cheeses. These are local cheeses, this right? This local cheese. And local bread, local too. Local bread, yes. Wow. So to finish a, a lunch is, is perfect. Mm. I'm, I'm in heaven with this. I wanted to get a look at Ugo's wine school, too, a place that's produced a lot of great winemakers in this area. So we took a little road trip. The school was designed by Ugo's brother, an architect who works in a super cool, eco-friendly style that reflects the student's low-tech, artisanal, small-batch approach to winemaking. Everything here gets recycled, including a lot of reclaimed materials that were used to construct many of the buildings. Originally, the spot wasn't a wine school at all, but for years produced the region's other specialty, olive oil. So this place was an olive oil factory when yes, you bought it? Yes, Obviously a very old very olive old oil factory. factory. This is a pretty amazing piece of equipment. Is it? Is this stone? No, that's iron. It's iron, so yes. it's an iron crusher. Yes. And do you still use it? Yes, yes. But of course I hadn't come to see olive oil pressing. 
but to see how they teach aficionados like me small batch winemaking. So this is it. This is all the equipment that you need to exactly. make wine with. Exactly. It's really? a full winery wow. here. Okay. So <laughs> let's talk about it. This is the stemmer and crusher. And, and crusher. And yes. where, where, where does the juice Basically, come you, out? Basically, you, you, you arrive with you in a box with grapes. Right. You put over there, and then you have this, 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 the crush here and the steamer here. Oh, okay. And then they go directly to, to the fermenting tank. And then it comes out of there, and this you is You finish your maceration, uh -huh. you finish your fermentation, yes. and then you press here. So you're going to put the solids here, yes. the wine directly to the, to the barrels. To the barrels. Now I think I could like do this in my garage. Absolutely, you need I, a hundred square feet to a full wine. I'm, I'm, gonna compete, make, I'm making wine. I compete with the, good, with the big guys. Oh, <laughs> that is super cool. The dozen or so students at the school don't just read and hear about winemaking. They actually get their hands dirty making their own batches. I can't think of a better way to truly begin understanding the subtleties of this age-old process. Form Tres Mujeres Winery, learned winemaking from Hugo at the school. And along with some other former students, they've created a co-op of winemakers who share equipment and knowledge and grapes from the Guadalupe Valley. One of the Tres Mujeres, Yvette, showed me their aging cellar and began to sketch out for me what I could expect from their distinctive styles of winemaking. So this is the cellar where we kept our barrels. Yes. Wow, it's it's cool out here, it's cool, isn't it? It's naturally cool. Naturally cool. What are the walls? Is yeah. this just earth? It's just earth. So you have three different winemakers that are making wines and putting them in the barrels mm -hmm. here. Mm -hmm. Do you ever get mixed up whose barrel is whose? No, no. Or, no you know no, your barrel. Know. <laughs> <We> know <which laughs> it's your little are. baby, so you know what it is. But did, did each one of you make a wine in a different style? Yes, we make, each one make our own wine. Sometimes it's the same grape. Do they come out really different? They do. They do? Incredible, they do. What is your style like? I think I'm the wild one. So the wild my, my one? My wines are more, um, what I said, happy, more um, fruity. I use Grenache on my blends. Yes, and Grenache and is Grenache a happy grape. Grenache is a happy grape. Yes. So, your wines are really a party in a bottle. Exactly. Yes. <laughs> this is all the, the production here. Production. We're yeah. ready to... It, it's ready to sell. To sell to is sell here. here. Yes. Now I noticed here that these bottles um, are very blank. They don't have labels on them. No labels. Is it you just write the name on them? I no, that's see. the way we started. Yeah. Without label, without, without me, without everything. And you guys were doing what you wanted to do, and you love to make wine, and I love to drink wine. So, so you want to I try? would like to try it. But <laughs> what I want to try is that blend that gives you a little bit of each of your styles all in one bottle. Okay. Do you have do you have one of those open yes. here? This is Tres Mujeres. It's called Tres Mujeres. Tres Mujeres. Oh. And it does have about seven different okay. kinds of grapes. It's got a lot of body. Well, there are three women in it. <laughs> I discovered that these tres mujeres aren't just winemakers, but they're fantastic cooks. And wine for them comes fully into its own when it's in sync with just the right food. That yeah, so yours is the loosest, lightest, happiest style here. I don't know, these guys, they're, they're pretty happy. For their robust, youthful, fruit-packed red wines, they mostly rely on grape types that thrive in the area. Tempranillo, Grenache, Cabernet. And with those wines, we ate everything from smoked beef to asparagus quiche and a delicious pork salpico. And tell us, what, is, what are we having to go with? It's a uh, uh, chile ancho. Yes. Ancho chile. Or ancho chile in English. Chile ancho, ancho chile. <laughs> yes. It's uh, stuffed with the cheese. Oh, that 
it's delicious. I'm moving here. So I can, <laughs> I'm moving here. So I can, so I can drink this wine and eat this. What, what, would you cook for me? Yeah. Salud, salud. Salud, salud. This, this, this is amazing. When you say chilies rellenos, most people think about the poblano pepper, maybe the Anaheim pepper, but I'll tell you one of the most delicious chiles rellenos that you'll ever taste is made from the dried ancho. Well, not just dried, but a marinated ancho. And we're gonna marinate it first in an escabeche, kind of a sweet and sour red onion escabeche that I'm gonna make with some olive oil heated over about medium-high heat here. And while that's heating, I'm going to slice a red onion. Now the onion is gonna go into the oil and cook fairly quickly until it begins to brown. But remember, we're over medium-high heat, so it'll still have some crunch left to it. That's just about ready. And I'm gonna shave off a little bit of this sugar cone. This is what's called piloncillo in Mexico. Put the sweetening in there. And now the liquids. I'm gonna pour in about two thirds of a cup of wine vinegar. And a cup full of red wine. A fruity red wine works really well here. Now for seasonings in this dish, I'm gonna put a couple of leaves of fresh bay. If you've never had the opportunity to work with fresh bay, it is such an incredible treat. So aromatic, way more aromatic than the dried bay leaves you find in most of the grocery stores. And then I'm gonna put a little fresh thyme in here as well. Just put the whole sprigs of thyme and the whole bay leaves in there. Stir that around. I'm gonna season it with a teaspoon of sea salt. Let it simmer over about a medium low heat for about 20 minutes for all those flavors to come together. Now to prep these ancho chilies, you need to make a slit down the side, almost all the way to the pointy end. Open it up and then let all of the seeds fall out. And then you need to go back in and work at getting all of the chili seeds out of there, making for a really refined chile relleno. Now, once the chili is completely cleaned, and I'm going to toast the chili by pressing it down with a spatula on one side and then flip it over and toast the other side, just the same way, pressing it down. Then collect all of your cleaned and toasted chilies into a baking dish. And take your escabeche mixture while it's still warm and pour it over those ancho chilies so that they can soak up that rich goodness. And then let them marinate for about half an hour. To fill these ancho chilies rellenos, we have some ricotta. Not the everyday ricotta, but the hand-dipped kind that you find in the delis. That's the kind that they have in Mexico. It's much firmer. Some cilantro and some roasted garlic. But first I've got to dry off these marinated chilies. Taking a paper towel, I want to dry them inside and out so that the ricotta will stay put. I have already roasted some garlic, and then I'm gonna mash that roasted garlic with a fork. The ricotta goes in. Chop some cilantro. And mix everything together. Freshly ground black pepper and some sea salt. Time for the stuffing and presentation. And 
this is absolutely delicious red wine food. Think about one of the bold and full flavored reds, maybe a Syrah, maybe a Zinfandel, maybe even a Grenache would be really good to accompany this beautiful fare. But the Baja wine growing region is filled with more than just little boutique wineries. Located smack in the middle of it all, making wine since 1928, is El Cheto, one of Mexico's largest wineries. And their success, it's clear, stems from the passion and skill of Camilo Magoni, Cheto's winemaker for more than 45 years. I was lucky to have him taste with me the full gamut of what he puts in bottles. <laughs> You're in paradise. Tell me what you love about this valley. Why does it work so well for growing grapes? Because the climate, you know, we are near the ocean. The ocean is, uh, is cold, the water has cold water, so we have a debris coming in the afternoon, uh, similar to the old the coastal California area. You know? So what's the next wine that we're going to taste? We taste the Petit Syrah. This is vintage 2008. Mm -hmm. It's a great, great wine from Guadalupe Valley. It's probably Mexico's best known wine in the world, just because you have sent it all over the world for people to enjoy, to taste. I, I think so. It's, it's, a great, it's a great wine, uh, intense character, spicy wine. Mm -hmm. You know, it's... It says so much about this valley, I think, because it's clearly something that's been grown in a warm climate. Yeah. It's satisfying. It goes with lots of different food. food. Actually, with a piece of grilled tuna, this Green would be tuna. really delicious. The tannins are so smooth that They're smooth you, drink, you can drink this wine a little cold. That's so great. that's go great also with, with uh, seafood. With the seafood. Let's taste that Nebbiolo, because Nebbiolo is a grape that you don't see very often outside of Italy. <laughs> and here it is in the Valle de Guadalupe in Mexico, and it seems to like it here. The Italians say it's a mountain right? Mm -hmm. Well, he's This not is the not the mountains. <laughs> it does remind me a lot of some of the wines that I've had in Italy. And it reminds me of wines that I have here in Mexico, in this valley. And I think it's the perfect blend of those two. When we think of wine, most of us think of cheese too which might be why this region has spawned so many great artisanal cheesemakers. La Cava de Marcelo is probably the most famous one down on the road to Ojos Negros. The Ramonetti family has been making cheese here since Marcelo's great-grandfather immigrated here from Switzerland in 1911. Marcelo set out six different cheeses for us to taste, from a few days old up to two and a half years. Some of it flavored with black pepper or garden basil or rosemary. The more aged the cheese got, the better it went with Marcelo's wine, a powerful Cabernet Zinfandel Petit Syrah blend. Well, Senor Marcelo, muchas gracias. The Husong family, yes, the ones that own that famous Ensenada bar, may have started winemaking as a hobby, but now their San Rafael vineyards and winery in the Ojos Negros Valley turn out some really beautiful wines. The Husong's home has a stunning view of the vineyards and a pretty stunning outdoor kitchen, too. It's a nice place to hang out with Louis. San Rafael's young winemaker, who did his training and went to chef's school in California's Napa Valley. 
He had pulled together some ingredients for a fish dish that he thought would really show off one of his wines. So tell me what you just put into the grill. I just put in um, hickory. Hick what <laughs> chips that were that have been soaking in red wine? Uh, what, are we, what are you making? This? Well, we're gonna um, make some smoked and grilled trouts, uh, rainbow cool. trouts from a local farm. But first, we're gonna um, season the trout, okay. salt and pepper. Okay. And we're gonna do some uh, some vegetables just to flavor uh, some vegetables and a little white wine to flavor the trouts and put them on the smoker. Do a little uh, oh, green really? onion, um, some fennel. I love fennel. To go along with the trout, we're going to do a um, some grilled zucchinis, and then sort of make a mash, ma mash zucchinis to go with the, with the trout. So it's sort of like, I don't think I've ever had anything like that. <laughs> I mash. love these. These are my favorite zucchinis. It's it's sweeter, very light, sweet. Yeah, I love it. Mexican red garlic. Yeah, the one with the the hard stem yeah. in the middle of it. And we'll just mash the whole thing up with a little salt. Louis put together a great garlicky aioli to go with the trout, spiced up with some horseradish, plus a big handful of cilantro that anchored us firmly on Mexican soil. Mmm. Yes, it's okay. spicy with that horseradish. I like it. It's good. And what are we looking for? And then, well, basically we're just looking for, you know, the skin to come right off. Yeah. So what do you think? I think it looks beautiful. <laughs> I, I, I love the <laughs> I love all the browning that's going on on everything there. It just looks so mouthwatering. Some are a little We're just giving a rough chop before we mash them with the fork. So just and you're gonna need this bowl them. back, right? That the bowl one back. That yeah, with the same. Yeah, with the. the well, that one's seasoned bold. It's a seasoned bowl, so I'll pass it around garlic. I've waited for too long on this. Now I gotta taste it. Well, I taste it. So oh, I'm gonna get on this. <laughs> After having spent some time tasting and eating with a few of the artisan winemakers in Baja's wine growing region, I came to realize that wine is just a starting point for getting to know passionate people, understanding and sharing their resources, their creativity, their talent, and dedication and some pretty delicious food and wine along the way. Here, in and around the Valle de Guadalupe, you encounter a truly inspired way of life.